Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Leanne. I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, that's the reason my voice is this way. Uh, my mother and father are Chinese. That's the reason my face is this way. Uh, but, but now I live in Anderson, South Carolina, where I get to serve as a teaching pastor at a great church called New Spring. Uh, we have 14 campuses around the state of South Carolina, so if you're uh, looking for fried food, some college football, and some humidity, uh, come on out and make yourself at home. And if you're free on a Sunday, we'd love to host you. Um, I am a southerner now, so that's the reason I yawl a lot. Um, I drive a truck. Um, I have type 2 diabetes. And I really, actually really do have type 2 diabetes, but... Laugh at my pain, why don't you? And so um, it is a joy to be able to hang out uh, with you all here at LifeGate uh, in the beautiful city of Denver. And uh, I, I just love Pastor Nirup. Uh, I love um, the grace in his life and the gift in his life. Uh, I love his marriage with Hannah. And, and um, before I moved to the States five years ago, I traveled around this blue rock talking about Jesus for a living. Uh, spent 20 years just just circumnavigating this beautiful planet, and I, I've seen a lot. Like my eyes are small, but they're surprisingly strong. And I can tell when you're in a church uh, that honors Jesus, loves His Word, believes in the transformation that comes alone through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, where grace isn't just a buzzword, but it is experienced. And, uh, and that's the grace of God and the goodness of God, but largely also uh, the wonderful leadership of some amazing senior pastors. So how we just, come on, we honor our pastors in the house right now, and we love you so much. <laughs> They're amazing. They're, they're just good people. Uh, when I was walking in halfway through the first song, uh, one of the beautiful worship leaders just made that comment, oh, we're not just here because of a great preacher. And, and, and there's a lady in the back, yes, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Literally, she said that as I was walking in. So be encouraged, brother. Well, I've got a really simple word for you today. There's a countdown clock up there. There's a trap door up here. And I, get told, I got told that if I stick to time, I'm going to get given home-cooked Indian food. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, I'm about some home-cooked Indian food. So I'm going to go quick. Okay, so everyone take a deep breath. Breathe out. We're going to be moving, all right? Um, uh, this morning I woke up early because I wanted a, a, a little bit of fresh bread for you all. Uh, I felt because of the, 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 the fresh-made naan that I'm going to get this afternoon or chapati. I don't know what I'm going to be getting, but I'm going to get something fresh. So I thought I'd better deliver something fresh. So I got up about 5 o'clock this morning, uh, not because I'm holy, but because I'm on Eastern Standard Time. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm up early this morning. I'm asking this simple question of the Holy Spirit. How would you have me bring encouragement to your people this morning? And as I'm praying this prayer for about 15 minutes, I felt the Holy Spirit just impress this simple word on my heart that I believe is going to be an encouragement to someone in this room. I felt the Holy Spirit tell me about 5.30 this morning that someone here at our 9 a.m. service is in a season of waiting. You know God is good, you know He's strong, but you're waiting to see His goodness and His strength come to pass in full fruition. You feel that you've been given a promise, you've been given a word, you've been given a vision, a, a picture of what your future was going to be like, and it came from God himself, but that picture hasn't crystallized yet. And right now you are in a season of waiting. And it's important for us, dare I say, imperative for us as a faith community to process through these seasons of waiting, because no one likes waiting. Waiting is distressing. Waiting is disturbing. And waiting not properly processed through the Word of God and by the Spirit of God can become destructive to our journey. But how many know Jesus didn't come to destroy your life? Jesus came to give your life. That's, re that's the reason He gives us the Word of God. He gives us phenomenal teachers of the Word. He gives us community. He gives us His Spirit so that we can process, so that we can understand exactly where He is and what He's up to when we're in a season of waiting. So that's what we're going to do for 35 minutes. We're going to talk about waiting, waiting. And in about 36 minutes time, 
someone's gonna have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus because Jesus has already said yes to you. And about 30 seconds after that, we're going to give the Holy Spirit free reign to seal something that he began, come on, here this morning, as we talk about where he is when we are waiting, waiting. Let me pray and we'll jump into this word. Dear Jesus, help, amen. I seriously want this Indian food. (laughs) Waiting, waiting. I don't like waiting. I'm not good at waiting for people. People who make me wait stress me out. People who get there too early stress me out too. You know what I'm saying? Like, where are my people in the room who are the like 15 minutes early is just on time kind of people? Your stress, chill, bro, chill. I'm more of a kind of, if it's a five o'clock kind of pickup time, like 4.59 with 55 seconds, five, four, three, two, one, shazam, I'm that guy right on time. That's on time. Where are my people who just have no concept of time? Point them out right now, come on. In general, LifeGate is a house of no shame, but right now for the next few minutes, just shame them, just point them out. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we're gonna meet at No Nose Cafe and it's like six o'clock and we're driving all the way from Colorado Springs. You're coming from up the street. It's a six o'clock dinner, but it's like 6.20 you walking in. I'm hungry, my stomach is grumbling. I'm not looking at anyone in particular but you just be rolling in, just swatting in on your own time. What happened, bro? You stressed me out. Because one of two logical conclusions must be true. Either either number one, you suck at life so badly that you wanted to be there at six o'clock, but you just couldn't. You know what I'm saying? kind of looked at your watch, oh, it's 6.05, you're running around, you're trying to get dressed, you jump into your car, you get halfway to Nono's Cafe, hypothetically on a Saturday night before I preach on a Sunday, and you're like, oh, I forgot my shoes. So you gotta turn around, go back, get your shoe. So you stress me out because number one, you potentially just suck at life. Number two, you stress me out, I'll tell you why. Because potentially, you're good at life, but you just don't care about my time. You know what I'm saying? Your time is more important than my time. (laughs) Six o'clock come around and you got going, you know what, I really should have some dinner because there's like an appointment in my calendar, but you know what, the party can start when I get there. So either logical conclusion stresses me out. Either I have to help you because you struggle in life or you don't care about my time. When someone makes you wait, it causes you to ask questions. When God makes you wait, it causes you to ask questions. Has God made you wait before? Come on, how about that healing that you just felt you were gonna get? You've heard the stories, you've seen the video testimonies, that cancer that shrunk, that that disability that was overcome, that restoration that flowed from heaven and You give glory to God for what happened in that other person, but you ask that question in the quiet of your soul, where's my healing? Why do I get another bad report from the doctor's office? Where's my video testimony? Hey, I'm out here and I'm trusting you, God, but why have you left me waiting, waiting? How about that financial breakthrough that you're waiting for? You just know that God is the provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. And I know that he's got cattle on a thousand hills and I'm not even looking for a whole cattle from one of those hills. Just give me a little bit of a ribeye, Lord God. But it feels like every single week I'm just trying to make ends meet and these ends don't seem want to, they don't seem to want to meet together. And you're kind of going, hey God, why do you leave us? Why do you leave me? feeling like I'm never going to get ahead. Why do you leave me waiting? Waiting. Uh, How about that 
that future that you were promised. As a younger person, God gave you such beautiful dreams of what your future would look like, that dream job, that living with purpose and You've prayed the prayers and you've responded to the altar calls. You've lifted your hands. You've honored God. But for some reason, it feels like what you were created to do hasn't yet begun to unfold. And then it frustrates you because you see your brother to your left or your sister to your right and they're walking in their purpose. They're exercising their gifts. They are experiencing the blessing from heaven. But for you, you feel like you've been left behind and you are waiting, waiting. How about that ministry that you thought you were promised? There are some people in this room right now who just, who just felt like God is gonna open up the doors of influence and ministry for them. And you're like, I'm ready to go. You know what I'm saying? My, my Instagram preaching is right on point. My TikTok game is tight and I'm ready to go. But for some reason, the doors aren't opening. Why have you left me waiting? Waiting. How about some of the single people here in this room? Can you know that God has made you to appreciate every single season, including and especially singleness, and you've heard the talks and you're satisfied in Jesus, but you ask this question on a Saturday night. Hey God, am I ever gonna find the one who completes me? Why am I being overlooked? I, I see my friends finding the ones who are gonna, like they're gonna journey with these people for the rest of their days and it's gonna be such a beautiful thing, but how about me? There might even be a, a single young lady in this room right now who last night was going like, you know what? Like, what's wrong with me? Like, I'm doing everything right by the book. Like, I'm staying pure and holy, dating Jesus in the meantime, just waiting for like someone who looks like kind of Billy from Stranger Things but reads his Bible. I'm just like, just, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. And you're, like, you're laughing now, but some of you guys weren't laughing last night. Why? because you feel like you've been stuck waiting, waiting. How about the, the married couple in this room who've been trying for children for the longest time? And you're praying and you're begging God and you're doing everything right medically and you've gone through some treatments, but every single month, another test that says no. And you don't want to get angry out loud, but you rage inside. Why have you left us waiting? Waiting. You see, you all ask this question. When God leaves you waiting. And it's important that you process through what the Bible's got to say about where God is in the waiting because logically as human beings, our finite minds can land in two erroneous spaces. Either God can do something, but just won't. Or God wants to do something, but he just can't. Neither of those are true. But one of those spaces could be a space that you have landed in right now. So here's the question. Okay, big guy who obviously does a lot of upper body work in the gym, but not as much on his lower body. How <laughs> do I process where he is in the waiting? In the waiting. Well, that's the reason I love the word of God. And that's the reason I love LifeGate. I love LifeGate because even though I love your pastors deeply, the thing that takes my breath away is how much they love the Word of God and how they've put that into a community here in the corner of Denver. Because the Word of God isn't just an archaic piece of literature from back in the day. The Word of God is a living, breathing conversation that God wants to have with you every day. So when you ask a question, open the book because God will clear his celestial throat 
and he'll speak. And so that's what I did at about 5.45 this morning. Okay, God, where are you in the waiting? And immediately this story sprung to mind. It's a story that comes from the book of John chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, would you go with me to the book of John chapter 11? If you don't own a Bible, if you didn't bring your Bible, it's all good. I I texted Nirup early this morning, the scripture, and it's going to be on this giant iPad that I installed earlier this morning. And it's a story about Jesus leaving his friends waiting. And it's a really long story. I think it goes for about 45 or 46 verses. And for the sake of time and my Indian food, I'm just going to read the first five or six verses and tell you the rest of the story. But it's a beautiful picture captured for all posterity to speak to you about where he is when it feels like you've been left waiting, waiting. John chapter 11 comes after John chapter 10. That's not deep or theological, it's simple mathematics. And at the end of John chapter 10, the Bible says that after they've cruised around and healed some people and done some ministry, they're hanging out in a region called Bethany, east of the Jordan. It's about 15 miles away, a couple of hours walk from where this story is occurring. Verse one of the 11th chapter of John. The Bible says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary was, whose brother Lazarus was now sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for, the, for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So here's a picture of three friends of Jesus, Mary, her sister Martha, her brother Lazarus. And word is sent out to Jesus, yo, your friend Lazarus is sick. Can can you see the the suggestive language here? It's like saying, hey, you know what? The one you love is sick. Or in other words, we ain't just normal people. Like, Like we own the Airbnb that you stay in every single time. You're around Jerusalem doing your thing. You've eaten at our table, you've stayed in our house, you've told us stories, we have seen the miracles ourselves, and you've hooked people up that you don't even know. Now someone you love is on the edge of death. So you're Jesus, not trying to put this on you because I know you're a busy guy, but if you could drop everything and just come up the road because a miracle right now would be great. Jesus would make a declaration. No, this sickness will not end in death. No, this whole story is unfolding for God's glory. But then he sits down and does nothing for two days. He leaves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, the disciples who wanted to help everyone waiting. The Bible says after a couple of days, Jesus says, yo, it's time to go. The disciples by that time had decided it was a good idea to hang back because they remember the last time they were around Jerusalem, they nearly got killed. So they said, you know what, Jesus, maybe we should just let Lazarus sleep it off. And then Jesus said, no, he did. So we gotta go. Now the disciples confused because they had waited so long. Now Lazarus is dead, so they're walking along, scratching their head. They eventually get to the edge of town. And the Bible says on the edge of town, Martha would greet Jesus overwhelmed with sorrow, tears are flowing, she would inform Jesus, hey, Lazarus, the one you loved, died. Read between the lines, Martha is basically saying to Jesus, if you just got here in time, this wouldn't have happened. Why'd you leave us waiting 
waiting. Jesus smiles, explains to Martha, you don't have to worry because I'm the resurrection and the life. Death gets no say when I'm in the room. Let's keep on going and find Lazarus. He takes a few more steps, and as the Bible un uh, continues to tell the story, you'll see Mary, Martha's sister, step up to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, why did you wait so long? We sent you word. It felt like there was time. But now Lazarus is dead. And the Bible says, as Mary wept, in verse 35, the Bible says, Jesus wept. But they kept on pressing towards the tomb. They finally get to the tomb. The Bible says four days he was in the tomb, or in other words, decay had set in. It would have been a foul stench in that space. But then Jesus would boom. Lazarus come out. A dead man would rise again. Those who were left waiting would be overwhelmed with relief. But more about that later. I wanna ask this question now. Where was Jesus? No, 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 no. Where is Jesus when it feels like he's left you waiting, waiting? If you have leather-bound journals, you can pull out your pens right now and start to scribble down notes. I'm not saying you need to take notes to get into heaven. I'm just saying, why take a chance? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm messing around. But if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you can open that up and thank the Lord Jesus for Steve Jobs as you do so. Come on, find the note app because that's a wonderful piece of technology you have right there. You have like a Samsung device, one of those Google devices, you can put it away. I've got nothing for you from this point on in the message because you mess up our group texts. Like the whole thing goes green and it's because of that one Google person. You know what I'm saying? I'm messing around. So. Now I just want you to get three things about where Jesus is if right now you find yourself waiting, waiting. Point number one, write this one down. Where is Jesus? He's on the way. Jesus, come on, is on the way way. You see, they're right at the beginning of the story. Before Jesus made them wait, he'd already declared how this story is going to play out. Hey, it's for God's glory that this story is unfolding the way it's unfolding. I want you to catch this in your spirit and get this if nothing else. He's always on the way. I remember when I started following Jesus when I was 17 years old, I had a lot to catch up on. I, I didn't get to go to Sunday school. How many of you all got to go to Sunday school growing up? You went to Sunday school? I got to do like kind of like night Sunday school and I had to kind of like catch up. And I remember lis like, like listening, I learned this song when I was 17, that there's nothing my God cannot do. <laughs> Not true. There are things that God cannot do cannot lie. He cannot fail. He cannot let you down. Come on, he is always on the way. Come on, before we finished off our worshiping of God in song, we sung about the great I am. The great Yahweh who all the way through the Old Testament would reveal parts of his nature and his characteristic. As clear as a phone ringing in a quiet room, the Old Testament would boom. This is what God is like. He is Jehovah Jireh, provider, Jehovah Rapha, the healer, and he's also Jehovah Mafalti, the Lord who will always deliver. Come on, he is on the Way. Come on, turn to your name and let him know. Come on, he's on the way. Come on, I know you're stressed. I know you're freaking. I know you're annoyed. I know you're frustrated. I know you're bummed, but he is on the way. You know what I'm saying? Hey, FedEx might be running late. 
UPS might be running late. USPS is definitely running late. But our God never runs late. He is on the way. But you're going to freak out in the meantime. Because here's a deep and meaningful theological truth. Your timing and God's timing do not line up. That's one of the funniest things that I hear from the young men that I disciple. It always comes about six months or a year into our journey together and they'll always reflect to me, well, Dan, I'm just learning that my timing and God's timing just don't line up. And I always want to kind of say, like, at what point did you think that God is up in heaven kind of waiting for you to put in things into your Outlook calendar and he's like, okay, now I can like dance to your, no, no, no. Your timing and God's timing will very rarely line up. In fact, we as, humanity, uh, we as a humanity are knit together by this common thread. We have a proclivity to thinking that God is always slow and he should hurry things up. You know why? Because he's eternal and we are finite. When you're finite, a day seems like a really long time. But when you are the one who exists in eternity, hey, a day, come on guys, chill. We always think that God should hurry up because we are finite beings and this proclivity has been exacerbated by technology because now we are an instant gratification generation like never before. You know what I'm saying? In the old days, if you wanted something, you went out and you got it. Now, you're sitting there on your phone and you'd be looking around your Amazon Prime and you can't be handling no three-day delivery. Come on, no two-day delivery. I need my next day delivery. You know what I'm saying? You can't even watch a Netflix series and at the end of an episode, wait for that next episode starting in five, four, three. You gotta hit it. Am I right? We have been conditioned to want to see things move faster than they're moving right now. And I hate to break the news to you, we are on God's time and not His. But I want you to get this, He is on the way and He's always on time. I know it feels like forever, since your prodigal ran away from home. You're just waiting for them to come back. And you try to put truth into their heart, but for some reason they've rejected the message. And I promise you, he's on the way and he's always on time. I know it kills you from the inside to see that broken relationship and you want to see it healed and restored. I promise you, He's the one who always delivers. Come on. And he's always on time. He's on the way. Point number two, I need you to write this down. Not only is he on the way, he's right now present in your pain. This is the thing I love about this story. So Jesus, right from the beginning, tells Mary, Martha, the disciples, yo, I'm writing this story and the story is going to go towards my Father's glory. This will not end in death, it will end in life. And they get down to Bethany and everyone is crying and everyone is broken and everyone is hurt and everyone is confused. And this is the thing I love about this story. Jesus does not belittle their impatience. He doesn't condescend their confusion. He is present in their pain. I want you to hear this, that I'm impatient as you are. I get angry as God like you, at, at God like you do. I get frustrated at my father as much as anyone in this room, and still he looks at me and smiles and says, I'm present in your pain. How do we know that? Because the Bible says here in verse 35, in response to Mary and Martha's tears, Jesus too wept. Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus cry? He knew how this was gonna go down. 
He's already watched the end of the movie. So why did Jesus cry? He didn't cry because he was overwhelmed with helplessness. You know why he cried? Because Mary and Martha were crying. Why? Because Jesus is so present in our pain. He doesn't belittle us. He doesn't beat us down and say, you should do better. He goes, I know you're hurting. And when you hurt, it hurts me too. I get this question all the time. Does God see me when I cry? Does he notice the tears that flow when the lights are out and I'm lying in my bed? The answer is not only yes, but we have a God who cries with us. How cool is that? I know that some of you guys got fed a lie at some point in your journey leading to this point. Well, you got told that God's an angry guy in the sky with a lightning bolt in his hand and he's gonna take you out if you don't keep his commands. Nothing could be further from the truth. He's a God who is defined by total and absolute love. And he's not trying to make bad people good. He sent his son Jesus to make dead people alive, to make helpless people walk in hope. And he is present in your pain. How cool is that? God's like a sympathetic crier. Do you have any sympathetic criers in the room? I'm a sympathetic crier. If we go to a movie, you start crying, you won't be able to stop me. You know what I'm saying? If I go to a movie with my wife or my, my daughter and they start crying, I just can't stop it. As soon as they start crying, I can start feeling, you know, you start feel those, like the, the tears start to well, you try to stop it, you know what I'm saying? You know, you do this one. I hope like gravity will help, you know what I'm saying? You do, you do this one. <laughs> Makes it worse, you know what I'm saying? Like, God sees you're waiting. And he's present in your pain. Hey babe, what does it say? No, no. Do I do another test? No, 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 I can't do it again. Not this month. What did, we, what did we get wrong? I, I, we, we, we follow the calendar. It's, we did it right. We're just He's present in your pain. Hey, God, I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. I'm just so stressed. I just, I want to do something just special with my life. And I know that you want this as my Father in heaven. But as nothing's happening yet, he's present in your pain. So he's on the way. Turn to your neighbor, let him know. Come on, he's on the way. Come on. He's present in your pain. And thirdly and lastly, don't forget, he will get the final say. So in this season of waiting, no matter what is robbing you of your joy, stealing your peace, wrecking your sleep, I promise you this, he always gets the final say. Because I love the way this story comes to a conclusion. So they get down to the cemetery, to the graveyard, point out Lazarus's tomb. It's the fresh one. He walks over to this tomb People must have told him, yo, Jesus, he's been in there like a few days. It's gonna stink. Jesus says, nah, remember? I'm the resurrection and the life. Roll the stone away. Wait a second, you came here too late. No, 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 no. I get the final say on this story. And into that tomb, he would boom. Lazarus, come out. You know why he had to use the word Lazarus specifically? Because so powerful is the word of Jesus. 
so much authority in his final say that if Jesus didn't say, Lazarus, come out, and he just yelled, come out in a cemetery, <laughs> every dead thing would have rolled a stone away. There'd be zombies walking everywhere. Remember the Michael Jackson thriller video? Bah, 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 that kind of thing. That would have been going on. I feel in my spirit, someone here needs to be reminded that a season of waiting doesn't negate the power of God to speak into any situation, come on, and to get the final say. I'm telling you, come on, pain doesn't get the final say. Come on, rejection doesn't get the final say. Come on, failure doesn't get the final say. Come on, sickness doesn't get the final say. Come on, cancer doesn't get the final say. Come on, death does not get the final say. Jesus does on your story. That's the power of his word in an instant, in a moment. He gets the final say. Can I just remind you of how powerful the word of God is? Just one word to bring completion to a season. Come on, our God is so powerful. He could create the heavens and the earth in six days and still give us a day off to watch Denver Bronco football, come on, with just a word. Come on, our God's word is so strong, he can bring forth the nation of Israel from a pensioner and his barren wife. Come on, our God's word is so strong, he could split the Red Sea with nothing but a stick and a gust of wind. Come on, this is our God, he's so strong. He can bring down the walls of Jericho with nothing but a song and a shout. Come on, this is our God, he's so strong. He can fell the giant Goliath with nothing but a sling and a stone. Come on, this is our God, he's so strong. He can close the mouth of the lion, open the eyes of the blind, heal the sick, raise the dead, birth the church. He saved your crazy life. He is so strong. And with the word, he gets the final say. Come on, if you're going to praise him, may as well praise him properly. Come on, it's 9 a.m. We're in Denver, Colorado. The food is good. The weather is great. You guys live in altitude training all the time. So anywhere else on planet Earth you go, you can just run a marathon like that. I promise you, scientific fact. But the best news is, when you're waiting, you can smile. Go on, I hate it. But I know he's on the way. I'm gonna stand in faith and faith isn't an exercise to manipulate the timing of God. No, faith is an exercise to surrender yourself to God's timing. And even right now when I'm stressed, He hasn't left me. He's present in my pain. And in this story, come on, for His glory, He will get the final say.